I'm going to start my timer here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I made the title before I prepared my slides and it, I will talk about oriented matrix in the very end. This is mainly a survey talk and uh, in the end I'll tell you some some progress related to oriented matroids. Uh, I forgot, I want to thank the organizers and especially I want to thank them for letting me speak first because uh, I still get uh, very nervous whenever I give a talk and it's usually best when you go to a conference to give the talk early so then you can relax for the rest of the conference and enjoy it. So thanks for that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, what I want to tell you about is some recent progress about what I will call geometric hypergraphs and how they differ from general hypergraphs. And there's the recent years they have started building some theory to explain this and that's what I want to survey for you. Okay, so let me just start with the basic definition what is a hypergraph. Okay, so I will deal only with called, what is called k-uniform hypergraphs. Okay, so I have a finite set, these are the vertices, and there's a set of edges which are k-element subsets. So this is a k-uniform hypergraph. And uh, much of combinatorics deals with understanding properties, statistics of such k-uniform hypergraphs. Okay, so when k is 2, we get what is called a graph. Yeah? And there on the right is my attempt of showing you a three-uniform hypergraph. They're a little more difficult to draw because things start overlapping a lot, okay? Um, and what my talk will be about is to discuss the following two main questions. So how do geometric hypergraphs differ from general ones? And once you give that question a little bit of thought, then of course you might ask, well, what do you, ask, what do you exactly mean by a geometric hypergraph? And that itself isn't clearly defined. Some people have uh, used the word geometric hypergraph and give it a specific definition, but for me, uh, this is more of a meaning hypergraphs arising from some geometric situations. Yeah? And uh, along the way, please interrupt me anytime and ask questions if there's something that's not clear. Okay, so here's the outline. So first, I want to give you some examples. Examples of geometric hypergraphs and I want to compare them so I made some matchups here where I'm going to compare these geometric hypergraphs to what we might think uh, to the combinatorial version or the look at this similar statement but combinatorially and see how these things differ so that's to answer the first question right well how do these things arising from geometry differ from the combinatorial version so these are three examples I picked out, but the, the list could go on and on and on. Okay? These are just illustrations. And after that, we will, I will tell you about a very recent uh, invention called the semi-algebraic hypergraphs. And these are uh, the most recent, this is sort of the frontier of research and tries to explain why geometric hypergraphs or give it that's a sort of definition of geometric hypergraphs and explains this different behavior okay and then it turns out that uh, you can also use a structure that I'm interested in called oriented matrix to get hypergraphs and you see something similar happening there so that will be some report on some re recent uh, recent things okay so that's the plan um, so let's start with these matchups. So first one is Helly versus Turan. Now Helly was an Austrian mathematician working mainly in analysis, I think. And, but he has a famous theorem in convexity theory about the intersections of convex sets. And then you have Turan who has a famous basic theorem about uh, cliques in graphs, right? And density, edge density in graphs. And these are the two things I want to compare. So let's start with what's called two-run graphs. So the two-run graph TNR, now this is a two-uniform hypergraph. Uh, you obtain this by partitioning the vertex set, your n vertices, into r parts of as equal size as possible. Okay, so the size will differ by at most one. Okay, and 
when you have different, uh, so you partition like this, and for any ver pair of vertices that lie in distinct parts, you put an edge. Okay, so this is the two rung graph. And what's important to note is written here that T and R has no complete subgraph on R plus one vertices. Okay, this is very easy to check. It's also very easy to check that this graph has this one times, no, one minus one over R times N square over two edges, roughly. What you should think of this is an R minus one over R fraction of all the edges, okay? So in a sense, so this is just measuring the density of the edges. So how many edges are there compared to the possible number of pairs you could have? Okay? And Turan's theorem, by the way, says that if you have higher density than this fraction, then you get, you must see a complete graph on R plus one vertices. So this is sort of the threshold. You can go up to that density without getting a complete subgraph on R plus one vertices, but if you go above this density, complete subgraphs of size R plus one will appear. And you can imagine this in, uh, for a higher uniformity as well, okay? Although, in fact, uh, the two run numbers for higher uniformity are less known. Less is known about them. But still, you have the same phenomenon like this, okay? But the way I want to think about this in my comparison with uh, Halley theorems is that in an arbitrary graph or hypergraph, you can destroy, it's possible to destroy all large cliques. I'm not going to say specifically what large is, but you can do this by removing only a fraction of the edges. Okay? So for example, you, I take a million vertices, all the edges are there, complete graph on a million vertices, and now you're allowed to, dis, to remove 1% of the edges, okay? If you remove carefully, you select this in a careful way, which 1% of the edges you remove, you're allow, you, it's possible to uh, end up with a graph that has very small cliques. In fact, the largest clique will consist only on 100 vertices, right? So only with that 1%, this is possible, right? And it's completely independent of how many vertices you started with. Just by that 1%, you'll end up with only a clique of size 100 at most. Right? This is what, how I will think of Turan. Okay, so now let's see a geometric hypergraph. And this is related to Helly's theorem, which is about intersections of convex sets. Um, and the way I'll do this, I'll imagine a bunch of convex sets in the d-dimensional space, and I'll make a d plus one uniform hypergraph by making an edge whenever d plus, those d plus one sets intersect. So each set corresponds to a vertex, and if a d plus one tuple intersects, I'll put it a hyper edge there. And in this sense, you can encode what we call the intersection pattern of this family by a d plus one uniform hypergraph. Okay? And it turns out, this is the consequence of Halley's theorem, it, that the intersecting subfamilies, so those subfamilies that intersect, which have size at least, size k, and k is at least d plus one, in that hypergraph, I see these as cliques of size k. So cliques on k vertices, right? So if in this intersection hypergraph, you see k vertices and all d plus one tuples are there, then the corresponding sets all have a point in common, all right? This is a consequence of Halley's theorem. Okay, so that's that hypergraph. So here was an example with uh, five sets and the, the four vertices, leftmost vertices, they are supposed to form a clique in that picture. All right, so that indicates that those four are intersecting. Uh, okay, so in this sense, we record the intersection pattern as a d plus one uniform hypergraph. Now there's the following theorem that is the result of uh, several people a weak result of this was by Kachalski and Liu, then Ekhoff and Kalai independently proved this statement here. It's called the fractional Halley theorem. So let F be a family of convex sets, a finite family. Let alpha be some parameter between zero and one. Now if an alpha fraction of the d plus one tuples are intersecting, then F has an intersecting subfamily of this size, or at least this size, okay? Now what's important to note here is that for any fixed alpha, this is some fixed, any alpha greater than zero, this is some fixed number greater than zero, okay? And the way you can interpret this is that if you're dealing with intersection graphs from convex sets, 
you cannot destroy all large cliques by removing only a fraction of the edges, right? So if I'm allowed to remove 99% of the edges from this complete thing, right? If what's left was still an intersection graph, there's still going to be a large, uh, complete, a uh, large clique left over, right? Because this, even if alpha was 99%, uh, this is still going to be positive. So if f is large, the largest in intersecting subfamily must be large. So you have a large clique. And this is the uh, quantitative difference between this type of hy hypergraphs and the ones that you saw in Turan's theorem, in which just a percentage you could destroy all large uh, hyperedges. You cannot do that for these intersection graphs. That's what uh, Turan's theorem is it telling us. Uh, the case of these Halley theorems and intersection patterns, it's uh, quite special that, in fact, this whole theory has a really underlying combinatorial theory that explains it. Uh, this is based on simplicial homology or commutative algebra, if you want. It's related to um, face rings and these upper bound theorems that uh, Stanley proved. And Kalai was also instrumental in these, these things for the convex sets. But really, there's an underlying, the underlying theory that explains this. And if you read a, a modern paper on these intersection patterns, you might never see anything about convex sets at all. It'll, it'll just be simplicial complexes. And yeah. so, the, so this theory has become very advanced. And uh, the questions that are getting motivated don't really come from convex sets anymore. They come from this underlying theory in some sense. OK, so that's one example where we see this quantitative uh, different behavior. Next one is a matchup between Erdor Sekres, the two guys on the top, and Ramsey uh, below. Now, this might be well known to you. So let me first remind you what the Ramsey numbers are. So let R, this is a number with two depending on two parameters, k and n. It's the smallest integer such that every k-uniform hypergraph on R vertices contains a clique or an independent set of size m. Okay? Here are some rough known bounds. So th these numbers are, are very uh, fundamental and deep numbers in combinatorics. We don't know how to uh, estimate them exactly, but these are the current bounds. So the, for k equals 2, we know that the Ramsey numbers behave like an exponential. We don't know the base of the exponent. For k equals 3, this is the big open problem. There's a lower bound, which is slightly more than exponential. An upper bound is a tower of height 3. OK? And then there's a, a very nice theorem that deals with the cases k greater or equal to 4, which says that the uh, order k Ramsey number, it's bounded above by a tower of height k and an exponential in the previous Ramsey number. So the main open problem is this k equals 3. And the conjecture is that this is really doubly exponential, right? which would tell us that the Ramsey numbers, they grow, these functions grow in tower heights, increasing according to the, uh, to the uniformity. Right? So this is the conjecture that most people, most experts in the field believe, really, that this is the right order for the uh, case k equals 3. OK, so these were the Ramsey numbers. Now, Erdos and Sekres, in 1935, they came across the Ramsey numbers while looking at a geometric problem. And they formed a geometric hypergraph, which I'll explain to you now. You take n points in the plane. And suppose they're sufficiently in general position. No 3 are on a line, and no 2 are, have same x coordinates. So you can sweep and order them linearly this way. OK, like I did here. So for any triple, what you're going to do is you're going to put an edge if the point in the middle lies below the line determined by the two outer ones. OK, so I have these ordered points. Here's a point, here's a point, here's a point. And if you draw this line and the middle point is below that line, you form an edge. OK, and if the point in the middle was above that line, you make no edge. This gives you a three-uniform hypergraph. And what Eris and Sekris proved was that the Ramsey number for these kind of hypergraphs is exponential. Right? 
which is less than the general Ramsey, known Ramsey numbers for uh, three uniform hypergraphs, much less than the conjectured value. Right? So again, we see this quantitative drop in the behavior. Everything clear so far? So this was a, in this paper also was a, an important or a long-standing conjecture regarding uh, points in convex position. I'll mention this later. It was recently solved by Andrew Sook, and I'll mention something about that later. Okay, so they formulated in this language n cup and n cap, which simply means n cup is a complete subgraph on n vertices, n cap independent set on n vertices. Okay. So now, let's look at this last matchup between Pach and Semeredi. Now the result I'm going to mention is not by Pach alone. It appeared in a paper with many co-authors, but this uh, whole thing was motivated by a problem by Imre Barani that uh, Janos Pach solved several years ago. Um, and while doing this, he realized it was about some geometric hypergraph and he realized that he needed to use some regularity lemma like from Semeredi's regularity lemma and on, on the way he discovered that there's some kind of extreme regularity happening for geometric hypergraphs. Okay, and this culminated in a result that you will see uh, shortly. Okay, so let me first try to explain to you Semeredi's regularity lemma. This has uh, become known as a one of the most powerful tools in combinatorics, extremal combinatorics these days, uh, has many generalizations. Here's a rough statement of what it says. So for every epsilon, every positive epsilon, you can find some integer m, depending on epsilon, such that every sufficiently large graph admits what they call an epsilon regular partition into at most m parts. So that's k parts, k is at most m. Okay, now let me explain what this means. So I said k parts, but I had a v0 here. So first of all, v0 is some small set, which is sort of a remainder, an error set. You throw this away. v0 is very small. v1 to vk, they have equal size. And the, they are represented by these blocks here. Okay. And what does epsilon regular mean? So it means that um, at most an epsilon fraction of these pairs should be what's called epsilon regular. What this means is, look at the vertices that are here and look at the vertices here and count how many edges are going across. And you divide by, you measure the density, so the number of total possible edges that go there and you, you take the number of edges divided by the total possible number of edges, right? And this is the density of this pair. And what an epsilon regular partition means that Apart from a small fraction of the pairs, all the pairs have the following property, that that density between this part and this part can be measured by only looking at a small subset here and a small subset here. You measure the density there, that tells you the global density, up to some epsilon error, error term. And so you use this by setting epsilon very small, of course, and then you get a good picture of what this global graph looks like. Right? And the important thing here is that this m depends only on that error term. Right? So somehow you get a very good global picture of the entire graph by only finitely many vertices and what's going on uh, by measuring density of only small subsets here and here, here and here, so on. Right? And Semeredi actually discovered this lemma not for a problem in graph theory at all, for a problem in additive combinatorics. Right? And so this has a, a lot of um, applications beyond just graph theory. And I believe people have tried to do or have gotten versions for higher uniformity as well. Um, so this is an important theorem, a little bit complicated to, to grasp, but basically means you can get finite number of parts, they're almost equal size, and you can roughly estimate what the graph looks like by just looking at small subsets. Okay, so that's uh, the Semeredi regularity lemma. Now let's look at the hypergraph that uh, Poch was um, studying when he discovered this uh, regularity for geometric hypergraphs. So here you're given a finite set of points in RD. Suppose you, there are 
uh, shooken up enough so that they're in some ge general position with respect to the origin. I'll say what that means later. Now you can define a d plus 1 uniform hypergraph. I'll call this h of p. It has the vertex at p, and the edges are those d plus 1 tuples that contain the origin in the convex hull. Okay, so here is the origin. I have a bunch of points, a points cloud scattered around here. And this triple contains the origin. The triangle you form here contains the origin, so I put that triple into my hypergraph as an edge. Same with this one. And so you do this all over, okay? This is a way of generating such a d plus 1 uniform hypergraph from uh, a points cloud. So from some general data that you have from some measurements, I don't know where that came from. Okay, so here comes the regularity lemma that they, or theorem that they discovered, starting with uh, Pa, but uh, this is 0, 1 regularity, and it appears in, the, in a big paper by Fox, Gromov, Laforgue, Nauru, and Pa. It says the following. So you fix parameter d, which is your dimension, and error term epsilon. Then you can find some integer, k, depending on epsilon and d, such that for any k, any small k, greater or equal to this one, the following holds. Take any of these geometric hypergraphs that I explained. You can always find an equitable partition. This means partition into nearly equal sized parts. Sizes differ by at most one, such that all but at most an epsilon fraction of the d plus one tuples are homogeneous. Now, what does homogeneous mean? It means that either between, if you look at a k tuple or d plus one tuple here, either all the possible edges are there or none of the edges are there. Okay? So, this is a very extreme form of regularity. So, remember in Semiretti, you had a part here, you had a part here and there was some density going across, right? And you could measure the density on small subsets, and that would give you an estimate of the global density. Here, what this theorem is saying is that the density between the parts is either zero, there are no edges here, or one, all edges are here, okay? So that's why we call it zero, one regularity. It's the same as Semiretti, except that the, the densities concentrate either on zero or one. So you get exactly the same as Semiretti, but with these concentration of densities at zero or one. Right? So this is very uh, extreme form of regularity. Okay. And this, uh, like I said, this was a culmination of uh, several partial results and uh, in the end obtained this one. And one also observed that in similar geometric hypergraphs, the same thing happened, and that's why what motivated people to, to ask, well, there must be something going on with these geometric hypergraphs that lead to this kind of results. And they tried to describe what this is. And that uh, gives, leads us to this uh, general definition, which I'll call semi-algebraic hypergraphs. Okay? So the, you don't really have any, so for between, between parts, you really have Everywhere. No errors? No error, yeah. Either everything is there or nothing is there. Yeah. Except for, just like in, uh, just like in Semiretti, maybe an epsilon fraction of the things don't follow this rule, right? But you make epsilon small, then really the, the ones that are regular, they really are complete, complete or empty. Yeah. Okay, so now we get to the semi-algebraic hypergraphs. So these arose uh, because in discrete geometry, discrete and computational geometry, people were looking at systems of geometric objects and they were proving the kind of results that we saw earlier, okay? Ramsey numbers and, and such. And they realized that the complexity was always smaller than the, what you would get, was smaller than what you get from the abstract combinatorial theorems, right? And why was this always happening? Every time they looked at some kind of geometric structure and a hypergraph arising from this, this complexity was always dropping. And in 2005, Alon and other people introduced this notion. I think they introduced it first for graphs. So let me first tell you what I will think of as a semi-algebraic set. So a subset of Rn 
n is some big number. It's a set of points that satisfy some list of polynomial inequalities. Okay? Each pi here is an n-variant polynomial, and I call this a semi-algebraic set. There are other definitions, but uh, I think this is sufficient. One can reduce to this case. Right? Some people include polynomial equalities as well, but for that you could just take p1 and the next one is minus p1, then you get an inequality. Right? So this is some kind of set, subset of points in the n-dimensional space. Now what is a semi-algebraic hypergraph? So fix some semi-algebraic set in r to the d times k, and we'll define a k-uniform hypergraph um, as follows. Vertices is some list of n points in the d-dimensional space. Okay? And edges come from taking a, an ordered k-tuple, and let's order it so that they have increasing indices. Okay? And just concatenate those, you get a point in r to the d times k, and check if that point lies in your semi-algebraic set. All right. Is it clear? All right. So if you concatenate k of these z-dimensional points, you can think of that as a d times k-dimensional point, a point in d times k-dimensional space. Then you just check if that one belongs to your set S. Uh, usually, we make it with this order definition. There are other definitions that uh, you could avoid that if you change the definition a little bit, but this is general enough. And this hypergraph, you say that it has description complexity t if all of these numbers that appear in this definition is at most t. So k and d, that should be at most t. The number of polynomials defining s should be at most t, and each polynomial has degree at most t. All right, so you just bound that above by this t, and then you say that's the description complexity of that hypergraph. And uh, yeah, here it is. Alon, Paul, Pinkasi, Radocic, and Sharir, they introduced this notion for k equals 2 as a sort of unifying notion describing a bunch of geometric uh, situations, a bunch of results from discrete and computational geometry about intersection graphs or of basic um, geometric objects. Okay, so recently a lot of uh, attention in discrete and computational geometry has been paid to these semi-algebraic hypergraphs. Uh, Poch was here in 2014 speaking at the ICM, and this was one of his main topics, was to discuss these, uh, these hypergraphs. Now, a recent result, a couple of years ago, so is to look at Ramsey numbers for these. So let me just define R sup t sub k of n. These are the Ramsey, just look at Ramsey numbers for semi-algebraic hypergraphs of description complexity t. All right? So you're just reducing your class of hypergraphs to these that can be described semi-algebraically uh, with complexity t. And let's look at the Ramsey numbers for those. So Conlon, Fox, Poch, Sudakov, and Suk proved the following bounds on the Ramsey numbers. Okay. So rk, tn, is bounded below and above by a tower of height k minus 1. Right? Uh, they have this c2 here, it's a little bit annoying, maybe one could get rid of this. Uh, these, and these c1 and c2 are just constants depending on k and t. So notice that these tower heights are exactly one less than the tower heights, which is conjectured for the regular Ramsey numbers. Right? So this theorem really says that the Ramsey numbers coming from semi-algebraic sets are special and the tower height drops by one, essentially. Right? Now, how does this relate to the previous uh, theorem? For example, the Erdos-Eckerus theorem I mentioned. I had my points. Right? And when did I make an edge? I made an edge if this point was below the line here. Right? Now you might be able to see that this is a semi-algebraic hypergraph. Right? This relation that this point lies below this line, you can write down equations for this, or polynomial, and the, you can write down equations defined by polynomials, and 
you will see that this hypergraph you get is semi-algebraic. Right? And therefore, you get this, um, you get for free this uh, previous Erdos-Eckers theorem, in a sense, up to, um, up to this error term, sorry, this error here, and to the C2. Okay, now the next result that they proved, and this is uh, one of the results from the big paper by Fox and company, that is, again, you get 0, 1 regularity for any semi-algebraic hypergraph. Okay, so you take a positive integer, t and k, so you've, you need to bound the complexity, t, and you ba fix k, the uniformity, and... Yeah, and for any epsilon, you get exactly the same thing. You get this zero, one regularity, right? So then there's some constant number of parts you can split your vertex set into, right? Such that between parts, either it's complete or it's empty, right? So very extreme difference from what the uh, Zemmeretti regularity gives you. An example. Consequences of this is, for example, the previous uh, zero one regularity lemma. You also get the fractional Erdos-Eckers theorem, which was uh, one of the fundamental uh, tools needed for Suk's proof of the Erdos-Eckers conjecture. And all of these things follow from the semi-algebraic regularity, or zero one regularity, right? So just to remind you, the previous reg zero one regularity was about hypergraphs where you formed an edge when the convex hull contained the origin, right? And you can easily see, well, I'm not going to do that here, but you can set up equations, they will be polynomials that tell you whether this happens or not, right? So this hypergraph is a semi-algebraic hypergraph. Okay. So uh, that is uh, sort of the state of the art, are these semi-algebraic hypergraphs and that you have reduced complexity for those. Uh, now, in his talk uh, at the ICM, Poch was explaining this and he was saying that there seems there could be a combinatorial theory underlying this that explains what's going on. And he uh, said that we currently don't know and we still don't know, but I'm going to give you an example of uh, that this could be true. All right, that's the next topic. Um, and that's where we get hypergraphs from oriented matroids. So the picture here is some representation of some small oriented matroid. Right? Okay, so. What are oriented matroids? I need to explain that. Uh, one way to think of them are as generalizations of point configurations. Okay? So I'll give you this small example. I have uh, five points. I label them. One, two, three, four, five. And what an oriented matroid is, is reading off the combinatorial, in a combinatorial way, the relative uh, positions of these points with respect to each other. Right? So, for example, 2 is contained inside the convex hull of 1, 3, 5. I would like to know this kind of things. But whether I push 2 a little bit away, but keep inside that triangle, I don't want the oriented matrix to change. So this should be purely combinatorial data. So one way to do this is record what's called the circuits. And the circuits is the matroid word for this, but uh, what this is recording are non-separations. Okay? So I look at subsets, pairs of subsets that cannot be separated by a line. Was there a, yeah. So the first one here, one and four cannot be separated by two and, from two and three, okay? So here's two and three, here's one and four, and I cannot separate those two subsets by a straight line. Okay? And so on, one and four cannot be separated by three and five, and so on. These, this data, this combinatorial data, this, these are called the circuits of the oriented matrix from here. Other ways you could represent this, you could record what's called the co-circuits. Co and these are the minimal separations. 
what I do now is for every pair of points, I draw the line between that pair, and I look at how does that line separate the remaining points. Okay? So between 1 and 2, there's a line, and it separates 5 from 3 and 4. That's this first closed circuit. Or 1 and 3, this lies on the boundary, so it separates the empty set from 2, 4, and 5. Okay? So for every pair, you would record this, and you get this list of data. Okay? And yet another way to encode such an oriented matroid is by orientations. We call this the chirotope function. So for every ordered d plus 1 tuple in general, but here d is 2, so for every ordered triple, you read off whether this, when you go in this order from this point to this point to this point, are you turning clockwise or counterclockwise? So 1, 2, 3, I'll define this as being negative oriented. And 1, 2, 4 has the same negative orientation. 1, 2, 5 has positive orientation. Right? And you record all of this. That's called the chirotope. That's another oriented matroid data. Now, the, one of the fundamental facts is that all of these determine each other. Right? If you know one of these lists, you can make the other list. Okay? And the idea of an oriented matroid is to just look at these combinatorially, what are the properties that these kind of data satisfy and define that to be an oriented matrix. Okay? So forget that it's coming from some geometric situation, just look abstractly what is it that makes these functions. Uh, what, find the axioms that define these kind of uh, sets. Okay? So one definition here, this is the circuit axioms. So I mentioned we had these pairs of sets. We'll think of the first one as the positive part and the second one as the negative part. And the underlying set is the union of the two. And of course, I want these to be disjoint. They should not have elements in common. So now you can define circuit axioms. It says that, first of all, you get rid of this empty set and empty set. And the first axiom, x is a circuit, then minus x is a circuit. OK? So I mean, if you think of circuits as non-separations, like we had, right? If x plus cannot be separated from x minus, it's natural to say that x minus cannot be separated from x plus, right? Uh, the second axiom is just saying that I want to look at the minimal non-separations, OK? So I just uh, throw away any some supersets. So I look at all the minimal non-separations. And then the final axiom is so what makes it an oriented matroid. And it says that take two circuits that are not equal, not opposite of each other either. If there's an element which is in the, first, in the positive part of the first one and the negative part of the other one, you can find another circuit which does not contain that element at all, but is part of the positive union of the positive parts and union of the negative parts. Okay. So this is, these are the circuit axioms for an oriented matroid. And you can, if you want, you can check easily those axioms are satisfied on this data. Right? In fact, those axioms are defined on this data as well. Co-circuits are the same as circuits, behave exactly the same as circuits. They're dual of each other. That's maybe a little harder to see, but this is a fact from oriented matrix. Okay, and I want to deal only with uniform oriented matroids, so we say that it has rank R if all these circuits, the underlying sets, have the same size, right? which was the case over here. So this uh, configuration in R2 gave me, gave me a rank 3 oriented matrix. Um, just for, to convince you that this really is a combinatorial structure, you could give the axioms for a chirotope as well. They look like this. You don't need to think, uh, you don't, don't need to memorize these axioms because I'm not really going to use them. I'm just trying to show you that these are combinatorially defined. Okay, so it's a mapping from the R tuples of your ground set to minus one, zero, plus one. It should be, this should not be identical to zero, and it should be an alternating function, okay? So you measure the, car, the orientation of this R tuple. If you transpose two adjacent guys, that should, uh, the sign should change, right? And then you have this complicated relation here, and this is a combinatorial version of what's called the grossman plucke relations. Okay? So the chirotope is a combinatorial extension of the determinant. That's what you should think of this as. 
And every oriented matrix is defined by a chirotope. And if you have a chirotope of a uniform oriented matrix, it really maps all the R tuples, R distinct points, to minus one or plus one. Okay. Now, how would we make a hypergraph from uh, such a chirotope? Here is one way. There are many ways, but here's one way. I call these chirotope hypergraphs. Let M be a rank R uniform oriented matroid on this ground set and chirotope given by chi. And then just take the vertices to be the ground set and for an increasing C R tuple, ordered increasing order, if the chirotope is plus one, you make an edge, right? And if it's minus one, you don't make an edge. This is precisely a generalization of the previous example of Erdos and Sekeres, where this guy formed an edge, right? And here, of course, the ordering of the vertices play the, plays a role. If you were to change the order, right, then you would get a different hypergraph. Okay, so this is one way to form uh, hypergraphs from oriented matroids, but there are many, many other ways. But for this specific one, you have the following. And that is the same as before, you have 0, 1 regularity. So the exact same thing holds, you get 0, 1 regularity, so you can find some k which depends only on the error term epsilon and r, the rank, and you can get a partition and and at all but an epsilon fraction of the R tuples are homogeneous. Okay? And so this uh, was a problem posed to me by uh, Xavier Guauk um, because he knew that I was interested in these oriented matroids and had some ideas how to prove things about them. And so it turns out that you have zero one regularity. And why is this interesting? I want to convince you that it's interesting. The, the sad thing is, these chirotope hypergraphs, they do not generalize arbitrary semi-algebraic hypergraphs. Okay? At least, I don't think so. They're not that general. They generalize a specific semi-algebraic relation, namely the determinant. Right? But, when the rank is at least three, since these are combinatorially defined, there are so many of them that you can show that they cannot be encoded by semi-algebraic relations of fixed complexity. Okay, so this really suggests that uh, all this uh, geometric hypergraphs and zero-one regularity can be described in some combinatorial terms. Well, we don't really know what they are yet, but this is an example that here's a combinatorial structure that has the same thing, and it's much larger than any of these semi-algebraic relations, right? And to prove that these are there are far too many of them, it follows from classical bounds on the Betti numbers of real algebra semi-algebraic sets by Milner, Tom, Warren, these give very severe bounds on how many, uh, how many different uh, semi-algebraic hypergraphs there can be. Right? And this, is, this you see in many, many cases that uh, things defined by semi-algebraic or algebraic sets, uh, the number of them become reduced, becomes very reduced. All right? And since these chirotopes are defined purely combinatorially, you can make many, many more of them. Okay. So in the last two minutes, uh, three minutes, I will try to say a little bit about how this is proved. First one is the general principle. This is what Poch discovered. So positive fraction for homogeneous selection. I'll explain what that means. Uh, so given an R uniform hypergraph, and we say that it admits positive fraction homogeneous selections if for any vertex su subsets that are disjoint, A1 to AR, you can find large subsets such that they are homogeneous. Okay, so in the R equals 2 case, pick any pair of disjoint vertex sets. If there is a positive fraction subset inside each of them, such that between here you're complete or empty, for some constant c, then, and this holds for any choice, then we say you have positive fraction homogeneous selection property. Okay? And what they show in the paper by Fox and company is that this property is what leads to 0, 1 regularity. Right? And if 
for those of you who know the proof of the regularity lemma, you could maybe prove this. It's not that different. You just need to shoot in this, uh, this property along the way. Right? So that's the property that makes things crystallize in either 0 or 1. OK. And so then, once you know that, of course, uh, you have a plan for how to prove 0, 1 regularity for oriented matroids. You just prove that they admit the homogeneous selections. Right? And right, so you need an absolute constant for which you have homogeneous selection. And this you can do with uh, some constant depending only on the rank. And I don't want to get into too much of the proof. But the interesting part is the proof is purely combinatorial and as opposed to the one by Fox and company, which really uses the property that these are semi-algebraic sets. All right, so first of all, you look at your circuits or your co-circuits, whatever. They satisfy a nice property that you can make compositions of them. Okay, so the composition of two circuits is you take the positive part and then you add whatever is in this positive part that does not appear here. You take the negative part and you add whatever is in the negative part but not appearing in the positive part. That's the composition of two circuits. Okay? So then from these circuits you build a much bigger set of what's called vectors or covectors and that's a partially ordered set. Okay? Naturally ordered. And the nice thing is that this order complex, if you look at the order complex of that partially ordered set, this turns out to be a triangulated sphere. And then once you have this triangulated sphere, you can build simplicial maps and use some borsuk ulam type arguments, which I will skip. But that's where this is coming from. Right? But the interesting thing here is that it's happening on a purely combinatorial level as opposed to the previous proof. OK. And so that's about it. Let me conclude. Uh, I hope that I was able to convince you that Whatever these geometric hypergraphs are, they have some extraordinary behavior compared to um, general hypergraphs. And there seems to be possibility for a general combinatorial framework to explain what's going on here. And this should, I believe that there could be something similar to what was done for the Halley theorems, but I don't know. I want to mention that for the Ramsey numbers, there's a, another combinatorial framework called transitive colorings. And Moshkovitz and Shapira, they got extraordinary, extraordinarily tight bounds on the Ramsey numbers for these, which show exactly the same thing that we're seeing for the semi-algebraic sets. And the transitive colorings are much more general than, again, much more general than the ones defined by semi-algebraic relations. All right? so, if you can define these things combinatorially, you, you're usually looking at some much greater set of graphs than what you get from semi-algebraic relations. Okay? And so that concludes my talk, and thank you.